Hello, I'm Diana Reich, the Artistic Director of the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival, Join the Conversation, and I'd like to welcome you from wherever you may be watching. Transforming the way that the festival is delivered from live appearances to an online version and offering an even stronger, more diverse and plentiful series of events is a reflection of our belief that literature and the arts provide a catalyst for dialogue, creativity, empathy, laughter and tears, binding communities together. We're enormously grateful to all our speakers who've dedicated their time and talents to the festival. Please buy their books as a way of enhancing the festival experience. It's my pleasure to invite you on behalf of my colleagues and board, as well as myself, to join the conversation. We hope that you'll do so in person next November, if at all possible. Charleston in South Carolina is a beautiful, historic and hospitable town, and the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival will definitely be going from strength to strength. I'm Suzanne Pollack, Director of Development for the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. This year, more than ever, we are so grateful to our generous donors, returning and new, who've made it possible to offer free sessions to everyone everywhere, building a truly international audience. There's still time for you to become a donor. We're taking donations throughout the month of November. So if you would like to become a sponsor, and we urge you to do so, please contact me using my email on the website. Thank you. Hello, I'm Diana Reich, Artistic Director of the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival, Join the Conversation. I'm delighted to introduce this session titled It's the Economy, featuring Robert Skidelsky, the eminent biographer of John Maynard Keynes, Emeritus Professor of Economic History, and a member of the House of Lords of the British Parliament. Nobel Laureate Joseph Stiglitz, Professor at Columbia University, former Senior Vice President and Chief Economist at the World Bank, and former Member and Chairman of the US President's Council of Economic Advisers, and Mary Corder, Professor of Global Governments at the London School of Economics, who will chair this session. This event focuses on the legacy of the great British economist John Maynard Keynes, whose ideas were influential in the United Kingdom, the United States and elsewhere between World War I and World War II and its aftermath. I'm speaking from England, which seems fitting, as Keynes was a key member of the Bloomsbury Group, a progressive British coterie of artists, writers and thinkers, whose rural domain in Charleston, UK, is a cultural hub and hosts our sister festival. The COVID-19 pandemic has been compared to a world war in relation to conquering the disease and dealing with its consequences. Robert Skidelsky and Joseph Stiglitz, chaired by Mary Calder, will consider whether Keynes's reforming economic theories are due for a comeback and might indeed already have been put into practice by many international governments without due credit. I'd like to express my gratitude to Joseph Stiglitz, Robert Skidelsky and Mary Calder for sharing their expert insights at the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival in this tumultuous year and to welcome everyone who's joining the conversation. Well, welcome to this somewhat unusual session of the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. It's unusual because it's about economics, though both our speakers, Robert Skidelsky and Joseph Stiglitz, are authors, and actually they write very readable books. Um, and it's also about uh, Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, the economist who was associated with Charleston. He was part of the, Charleston, England. He was part of the Bloomsbury set. He lived near Charleston. And so we're going to be asking 
what my Keynes have proposed in the current situation. I'm Mary Caldor, I'm chairing the session, um, and the other two people here are Robert and Joe. And we're going to divide the session into three sections. We're going to start with the current situation, the US elections, COVID-19, and what it means for the global economy. Then we're going to talk about Keynesian ideas and how relevant they are today. And finally, because this is a literary fe festival, we want to talk a little bit about culture and the economy. So let's start. And this, I should tell everybody, is a recording. We're recording this on November the 5th, which is an absolute nail-biting moment. We still don't know whether Joe Biden is going to win. It looks very, very close. And the last time I looked at my iPad, which I tend to do every five minutes, um, there was 1% less to count in Georgia. So um, we'll all be hugely relieved if Joe Biden wins, but at the same time, it is still appalling and very, very scary to think that 69 million people voted for Trump. So my first question to Joe is, what's gonna happen uh, and what will it mean both for the US and the global economy? Joe. Well, you're absolutely right. It is very uh, disturbing to realize uh, how divided the country is, divided uh, geographically, divided between those college graduates and non-college graduates, men, women, uh, by race. Uh, there's a famous uh, uh, line from Abraham Lincoln's speech, a house divided cannot stand. And we cannot help but think about that as we see America really, really divided. And it's very clear that Trump has played into and exacerbated those divisions over the last four years. Uh, it's been successful uh, in playing out those divisions uh, because the Senate looks like it'll be under the control of the Republicans, House under the Democrats, the presidency looks like Biden, but clearly not for sure. Uh, we don't know for sure any of those ingredients. It looks like America will be uh, a divided governance. And uh, in earlier area eras that might have provided the basis for compromise for people working together finding what you might call a centrist solution with the way the republicans have behaved since newt gingrich uh in 1994 and especially since uh, uh trump it's uh, 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 a no holds bar opposition. And so the country most likely uh, will go into gridlock. Now, Biden has lots of power as the president, assuming that he is elected, and he can undo a lot of the damage that Trump had done in the last four years. Because remember, especially in the last two years, there's been a house controlled by the uh, Democrats and he hasn't been able to do anything through legislation. It's all been by executive orders. And the nature of executive orders is that they can be done. Moreover, some of the most damaging aspects of what Trump has done has been in international relations where the president has enormous amount of power. Uh, withdrawing from uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, sabotaging the WTO, uh, uh, toddling up to dictators all over the world, and undermining our allies in Europe. So I think that's going to change. Uh, but at the same time, 
Europe will realize that um, there is an instability in America. It can't be relied on with that 50-50 vote. Who knows the next time a demagogue, even worse than Trump, could get elected, or Trump could, uh, if he's not in prison in 2024, uh, could uh, be uh, elected. So um, uh, I think the imperative for Europe and for the rest of the world that believes in democracy and human rights has to be to say, we have to reconstruct globalization, multilateralism, the global order, assuming in a way that's resilient to uh, America not playing the role that it plays since World War II. And uh, that's putting a lot of burden on Europe. Uh, it means that uh, uh, climate change has to go forward, but there has to be cross-border taxes. The WTO has to move from unanimity to uh, not giving deference to one country, whatever that country is as it has been doing in the election of a new head of the uh, WTO. So I think it's going to be a, a moment of reconstruction of the global order. Finally, uh, since it's, uh, the, the global economy is very interdependent, uh, what is clear, and the topic I'm sure we'll talk about more, uh, the Senate Republicans have been uh, reluctant to support the kind of uh, recovery packages that we need. Uh, you know, I, I've described what has happened in the United States is we built a half a bridge to the post-pandemic economy. We spent $3 trillion uh, in the spring, but now the Republicans don't want to finish that bridge. And of course, uh, a bridge that only goes halfway across uh, is going to collapse. Or to put it more, uh, maybe that metaphor isn't great, but what I, uh, the point is that there will be uh, a weak recovery in the United States. The data that was released today is certainly con consistent with that. Uh, and uh, that means America's recovery is going to be slow. And that means the world recovery from the pandemic uh, will be slow. And that will have to be taken into account uh, as Europe draws up its plans for the post-pandemic uh, economy. Um, yeah, could I, could I? Yes, follow? why not? Robert, follow um, on. Yes, I think what Joe said um, was uh, to start with the the uh, the cultural uh, impact of uh, the vote. Um, it seems to me that uh, Trump was unlucky in COVID. Had COVID not arrived to dent some of his rhetoric about how brilliant the American economy was doing, he might have actually got in even easier. What is true is some disconnect between culture and economics has been going on. And, um, and, and therefore, um, the, 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 the civil war in America is actually, or the civil the divisions in America are much more serious than just the economy stupid, which was what um, Bill Clinton uh, explained everything by. I, I, I agree. I mean, the half-built bridge, yes. Uh, who, I mean, will, will, will Biden finish the bridge? We, we agree, I think, everyone agrees that the world economy is actually in a bad place. Um, it's going to, uh, the, the forecasts are that um, there won't be any, any, any quick recovery. Uh, the only sort of growth area in the world is China next year, the forecast to be, but everything else is slowing down. And we're all on, in, in Europe, we're all on furlough um, and furlough has just been extended and other people are paid money for doing nothing. And, and that's as far as the demand 
support goes but if what do you what do you do beyond that and and is is biden um going to be more likely to spend money and finish the bridge um than trump and would he be able to finish the bridge? What are his powers to get stimulus measures past Congress in the next, assuming he takes office in January, in, in the three or four months after that? I mean, what, what can he actually do um, to, to get the stimulus going? So, so let what, me make a couple of comments on that. First, uh, I think um, uh, he... Uh, will be able uh, to get something through because uh, even the Republicans uh, realize there is a need for something. But what they have been proposing was, let's call it a skinny package, uh, minimal uh, help for uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, the worst affected parts of the, of the corporate community. And I suspect that there'll be compromise, can't be sure, in which there will be a skinny bill that emerges. But uh, some of the demands that the Republicans could put on could lead to, as I say, gridlock. For instance, one of the things that uh, 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 Mitch McConnell keeps talking about, and Republicans keep talking about, is uh, freedom from liability. You know, uh, our corporations ask their workers to go to work without masks, without protective gear, even if they were in a very exposed position. And uh, the, the Republicans are saying there should be no liability. Uh, and uh, the Democrats' response is, uh, you, you have to take responsibility for your actions. So that's been a source of tension. And whether uh, where that compromise on that issue versus the stimulus the economy needs, uh, hard to say. Uh, the the uh, ability to redirect money, which Trump used on several occasions, may now be used in ways that can move money from uh, areas where it is less stimulative, lower multipliers, to higher multipliers, to uh, focus on greater vulnerabilities, so there may be some potential of shifting around, uh, of using uh, uh, leverage. One of the, one of the uh, aspects in the previous package, the CARES Act that was passed in the spring, was that Treasury was allowed to underwrite losses for the Federal Reserve loans to the corporate sector. It's a very unusual program. But Trump's Secretary of Treasury was reluctant to use those powers. So there, that's an example of legislation on the books that could be implemented in a different way that would have the potential for stimulating the economy. You know, the scope of this, we don't fully know. And uh, that will be one of the important things that Biden's economic team will have to explore uh, very, very quickly. Now, I mean, one of the, oh, oh, let me make just a, a couple of uh, comments and we can come back. Um, one of the astounding things about the polls and the interviews that came up afterwards about how people voted was that those who supported Trump said they supported him because he was good for the economy. You know, I thought I was an economist and I thought I could judge whether his policies were good for the economy. And I can tell you, uh, I would have given him before the pandemic 
a low grade. And of course, after the pandemic, I would have given him an F. So uh, for uh, so many Americans to say he should get a A or at least an A minus or B, I find astounding. And it is testimony uh, to um, the, the uh, you might say the uh, nature and the dangers of populism. And let me uh, talk about a couple aspects. Now, what, do, what is populism? One of the things uh, about populism, and Trump is a populist, is that you don't pay attention to budget constraints. And uh, that's true of what Trump, Trump did. Uh, he, the Republicans were all worried about budget constraints, deficits, when we needed to spend the money in 2010 in, uh, after the 2008 financial crisis. But suddenly when they were able to give a tax cut for the billionaires and corporations, deficits didn't matter. When you have deficits of the magnitude that they ran at that point, it does stimulate the economy, but not in a sustainable way. And even before the pandemic, all the forecasts were that, the, or most of the forecasts were that growth in 2020 would be half of what Trump promised. You know, one of his slogans is promises made, promises kept. Well, this is a promise made, but not kept. Uh, less than half the growth rate. That of course, what happened with, with the pandemic and mismanagement of the pandemic was a massive negative growth, massive record levels of unemployment. And the Republic is not even providing adequate unemployment insurance. Uh, the final comment, let me just make is, I wanna pick up on what you said. The only country having significant economic growth this year is China. And of course, uh, Trump is trying to characterize the world in a zero sum way, restart the Cold War. Uh, the irony is that the new geopolitics where he mismanaged the American pandemic, mismanaged economics, is that China is growing. People around the countries around the world looking at China and we're seen as an example of a failure. And even when you look at the issue of the trade deficit, which is one of the main things he emphasized in 2016 in the election, that he would bring down the multilateral trade deficit, it's increased, increased significantly. Not a surprise, something that I had forecast given his disastrous macroeconomic policies. And yet American voters seem to say he's doing a great job. I don't get it. What I do get is the power of misinformation and disinformation. And that is what he, like all demagogues, uh, all despots uh, have, uh, ha ha has succeeded it. Uh, has been the basis of his success. It is extraordinary, but did Trump benefit from the Obama stimulus package? I mean, did the economy, some of the effects of that were felt during the Trump period? Well, well clearly it was part of the recovery. And, you know, the simple facts, you know, there, there, there are two questions always. What are the facts and how do you interpret them? The facts are that there were fewer jobs created during Trump's first three years than under Obama's last three years or Obama's first three years. So that was the recovery from, you might say, the Bush recession. Uh, those are the numbers. Then the question of who to get credit, uh, why was, why were things weaker? What would they have been uh, otherwise, the counterfactuals? And here, I think what is true is that Keynes, K 
Keynesian stimulus works. And that's, a, you know, the work that Robert and I both have focused on. Uh, uh, you, you have massive deficits and it does give a boost to the economy. So it did help, but <laughs> not in a sustainable way. Yeah. It was a sugar high. And given the size of the deficit, it's remarkable the how small the impact was. So the bang for the buck was really small. We wound up with a lot bigger debt and deficit without addressing the country's underlying problem like infrastructure deficit, education deficit, the things that would have contributed to long-term sustainable growth. Well, that's where the debate in Europe is now at. Uh, and that is um, how much infrastructure spending should be done. I mean, the IMF has uh, come out in favor of infrastructure spending. And um, a lot of people now are saying that that's where the concentration of the stimulus should be. It could be both national, big national schemes, and a lot of local a lot of local uh, schemes, regional schemes, quite a bit of reference to uh, some of Roosevelt's programs um, uh, in order to get a bigger bang, bang for the buck. buck a, a, an admission about the weakness of monetary policy. I mean, a lot of, there was a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of um, faith put into quantitative easing, in quantitative easing, that it would uh, encourage uh, borrowing. Um, and uh, therefore stimulate the economy in that indirect way. But if the market is shrinking, people don't want to borrow. And banks, anyway, um, are, 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 are full of bad loans. So monetary policies, even, even the bank, uh, governor of the Bank of England says uh, monetary policy has to work in a complementary way with fiscal policy. All that's, the relationship has to be worked out. How it's going to how it's going to work, but at least fiscal policy is back in business, and um, that I think it, it should never have it should never have left the scene. It should never have been discarded, but now it's back, and the question is what are you going to do with it? What sort of rules are you going to have for um, the deployment of fiscal policy? Are you going to start distinguishing between? Um, quality and quantity, in other words, also between investment uh, and um, <clears throat> current, current, uh, current account, uh, current spending. And um, are you going to stick with these very arbitrary limits that the European Union has? I mean, the European Union, you know, plucked out of the air a 60% uh, uh, a debt GDP ratio um, and, and has and has uh, the ability to penalize countries if they, if they break their, their uh, deficit uh, limits. All that seems to be need, needs to be rethought, but I don't see much rethinking. All, all I see is really a sort of sense that the old, old system hasn't delivered and we've got to get to something more sensible. But I haven't had any evidence of any fundamental rethink in fact one of the one of the uh, uh, one of the evidences of, of non fundamental rethink is that it, no one ever mentions the name of keynes they do all these things implicitly there is some sort of bowing to him but the, no it's too it's too contentious still and that i think testifies to the hold of neoclassical economics to hold it acquired from the 1970s, 80s, 90s onwards. And the fact that so many economists are now trained in this mode, and, 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 and yet they have to do things that go against their training. And they're uncomfortable with this, and they don't know, they haven't yet got the language um, to talk about it. But oh, right. actually, don't we need, and this is a question to both of you before we go on to more thinking more about Keynes, but don't we need to rethink Keynes for the present? You, Robert, said people are being paid to do nothing. And of course, Keynes thought, you know, whatever you spent the money on, it would 
stimulate the economy in another in other areas but actually is that a, some can we hold that assumption and that's especially true in an era of covid when actually the real economy is restricted in physical terms so how do we and 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 um Joe talked about how the stimulus wasn't sustainable. So don't we need something else to think about? Don't we need to go beyond yeah. games? Yeah, well, so oh. sorry, Joe, you have, you, 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 you go off. So, so uh, first of all, let me say, I, I agree with almost everything that Robert uh, just said, but I, uh, surprisingly for me, I want to be a little bit more complimentary about what Europe uh, is doing. Uh, and then answer uh, Mary's question. Um, the, Europe has done uh, something quite remarkable for Europe uh, that it couldn't do during the euro crisis. It, it's issued European bonds, euro bonds. Yeah. And that's a collective action uh, of a kind that they <laughs> found impossible. Not as big as necessary, but... Uh, 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 it, and more divisive, but it happened. Uh, secondly, uh, they, as they have provided money to countries, they've been very explicit that they're moving away from austerity. So they've given countries more slack than they did before. You're absolutely right that those numbers, 3% of GDP deficits, 15% uh, of GDP debt to GDP, 80% a, a debt to GDP ratio, those were pulled out of thin air. And just to put it in perspective, uh, the United States deficit to GDP, we're still going as a country, the US deficit to GDP ratio this year is likely to be something like 18%. So uh, we've, we've uh, broken uh, that, 3% barrier, uh, multiple fold. Uh, so the, the, so I think this is a moment where the old strictures are being broken because they have to be broken. Now, Mary asked, can Keynesian economics on its own, as it was understood, uh, work when we have COVID-19 constraints? And, uh, you know, Keynesian economics has evolved over the last 70, 80 years. And uh, if we went back to try to understand uh, why many people thought after World War II, we were going to have a uh, go back into depression, we didn't. And one interpretation of why we didn't was that the Keynesian war spending, which got us out of the Great Depression, was also a spending on structural reform. Mm, we moved from agriculture to uh, manufacturing, we moved from rural to urban, and that money changed America. We had the GI Bill that gave everybody uh, who had served in the armed forces, which was uh, all the men and a significant number of women, uh, as much education as they were qualified for. Um, so I've been arguing that Keynesian structural spending sp uh, can stimulate the economy. Now, that's important to, to put that emphasis because um, we're not going to get back to full employment in uh, restaurants, if people aren't going to go to restaurants uh, because they're afraid of the disease. But uh, we can help the people who lost their job. We can help the economy restructure to uh, ways that make it less uh, 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 exposed to the disease. For instance, let me give you an example. Big issue in the United States and elsewhere is how to open up the schools in ways that children don't get COVID-19 and don't spread it to their parents. Well, we need to spend a lot of money 
to reconfigure the schools. Some of our rich schools have done that. They've opened up social distancing, they end up classrooms, they've reconfigured. But most of our schools can't afford that without federal government assistance. That would create jobs that would enable schools to go on, that would enable people to go back to work, parents who are babysitting now, that would have a big effect. So the answer is that you can't just use the standard macro models. You have to adapt them to the situation of COVID-19. But we've been doing that for the last uh, period. So I think we're actually well prepared. And let me make one final comment just to reinforce something that Robert said. It's not only that we need to bring fiscal back into the game, but monetary policy is really going to be out of the game. Uh, and the reason I say that is twofold. First of all, when we thought, when the COVID-19 began, we thought it was going to be a short-term interruption, a few weeks. And the rescue packages were designed under that hypothesis. They were all designed to end at the beginning of June, end of June, something like that. Well. We're in November. Very clear it's going to be with us for a while. And what began as a liquidity problem has become a solvency problem. Banks can lend when there's a problem of illiquidity. They can help solve that problem. They can't solve a solvency problem. That needs fiscal support. And the fact that the Federal Reserve has made it so clear that interest rates are going to remain near zero for as far as the eye can see means there's not much scope for monetary policy you know uh changing interest rates from zero to zero doesn't have a big effect or even going from zero to minus 0.125 or minus you know no effect so monetary policy the reality is it's out of the game Fiscal policy is the only game in town. Before you come in, Robert. I wanted to answer your question. Yeah. Oh, well, you can you answer your question and my next question at the same time? Because I'll we've try. come to I'll the point try. about Keynesian ideas. And so I was going to ask you, but maybe you can answer both questions. In the blurb, it said that Keynes had said that the political problem of mankind, the solutions to the political problems of mankind were economic efficiency, social justice and individual liberty. So you're the person who knows most about Keynes. So can you tell us how he came with that, up with that? And can you tell us now back to my question you know, are there limitations to Keynesian policy in the current epoch? Do we have to think beyond Keynesianism? Yeah, well, I mean, of course, Keynes wasn't the last word in everything. And he died, I mean, he <laughs> I think died 76 years ago or something like that. And the world's moved on and we've had new thoughts. And I'll come to that in a minute. But on the specific question, of course, it's not. I mean, the COVID, the COVID-19 depression is 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 very different because uh, what we've done is we've shut down both supply and demand mm. uh, for parts of the economy because we believe high contact activities spread the coronavirus so we can't just use the standard um uh, you know macro macro models i mean in and and one of the things people will be saying is well in this situation isn't there a big um isn't there a big um, risk of inflation? You're pouring a lot of money in, you know, supply is contracted, you haven't contracted incomes very much. So isn't there a lot of pent up demand, um, uh, which is waiting to go? And, and that is a possibility, I guess. So there, but I mean, you know, what, what, what that argument ignores is the fact there's been a collapse in investment. And so although consumption power is uh, sort of being maintained in a way 
ready to ready to spring as soon as uh, the economy opens up. There has been a collapse in investment. As Paul Krugman said, no one, no one wants to build uh, office blocks in a plague. And, and so I think the effect of um, uh, coronavirus is to reinforce the, more, the, 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 the good model or the, the standard ma macro model that there'll be a deflationary, deflationary impetus in the in the next in the next uh, six months to a year, and that's what's got to be fought on, uh, fought against. Now, on, on the second question, um, which is uh, Keynes as a political economist, is really what you're asking. Uh, he did re he did see his task in in the 1930s as a political task. Um, in other words, economics could come to the rescue of politics. Uh, that's the way he saw it. Good economics could come to the rescue of politics. Good economics could come to the rescue of good politics. And the trouble with liberal economics, as it was taught at that time, is that it was laissez-faire, and that gave um, a huge opportunity to bad politics. That is, uh, the two uh, at the time, of course, being fascism and communism, as he saw it. Fascism very much, in some ways, quite Keynesian, but I mean... Keynes said, look, you don't need, you don't need murderous dictatorships in order to get a decent economic policy going. So he was a savior of liberalism and he um, thought um, that that was the most political, important political um, uh, object of what he was trying to do. Of course, there were, that was the problem of the day. Had he sort of, um, you know, had other th things that, that to give priority to, he would have, I think, explored the connection between mass unemployment and inequality. I mean, that was hardly, that hardly featured in, in, in the general theory, although it could have done. Today, as Joe said, I mean, we're much more likely to associate mass unemployment with unequal distribution of wealth and income than I think was um, than I think Keynes thought about. He did pay attention to it, and he thought there was a, um, a, an ethical problem in there, but he didn't link it up to his economic. The last thing I think he didn't think, well, he didn't think about ecology. He didn't think about natural limits to growth. That was beyond, beyond the horizon of the time. And I think he rather shirked the problem of supply altogether. I mean, there was a Schumpeterian kind of uh, argument going even then, which is that you proceed by creative gales of creative destruction. And Schumpeter accused Keynes of being much too sort of interested in equilibrium in, in, in rather static kind of view, whereas in fact, the dynamics of the economy um, escaped him. Um, I, think, I think Schumpeter was an act accurately describe how a capitalist economy moves through time. But that does raise an ethical question. Is it right that it should, it so, and is it, was it ethically right that the handling weavers of the, uh, of the early 19th century were destroyed by the machines in order to enable the greater good um, of, 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 uh, of the economy to be realized. Cheaper goods, cheaper cloths. Similarly, with small farms today, we get much cheaper food, but you know, the, the destruction, the, is it all creative? That's the ethical question that I think we need to ask. And Keynes didn't, he didn't quite address it. He was aware of it. Yeah, and I was thinking that when Joe was talking about the Second World War, I mean, he rightly said that it wasn't just a stimulus, it was fundamental structural reform, it was transformation, it was mass production of aircraft and tanks and changing a model of development and consumption. And if you think about the 70s and 80s, when neoclassical economics, economics became so fashionable, it was a period of declining productivity. It was a period when we needed to pay attention to structural reform. And now I think there is 
an incredible argument that economic policy has to embrace both the information infrastructure, you know, those children at the schools, Joe Stiglitz mentioned, need to all get laptops. But also it's got to embrace ecology, not just because of the planet, but because that, you know, bringing about resource saving is another way of improving the efficiency of the economy. So I would argue, yeah, we need to build that in to a new kind of Keynesianism. But I should ask Joe what he thinks. Well, uh, I agree. But let me put it in, in a little bit broader perspective um, and, and go back in a way to, to the environment and when Keynes was writing. Remember, this was a, a, the Great Depression. Capitalism was failing. And uh, the economics profession said the answer was laissez-faire, do nothing and it will recover. That wasn't a politically very per, uh, persuasive answer because it was going on and on and on. The other approach was uh, 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 a strong government, uh, communism. Um, and uh, that compromised the uh, principles that Keynes cared about, about liberty, freedom. Uh, and uh, in many ways, the West uh, has been caught uh, between that, that same paradox. Uh, mm -hmm. Reagan was about, officially, neoliberalism was about uh, a, a version of laissez-faire, do nothing. Don't worry about the increase of inequality, trickle-down economics will take care of it. Everybody will be better off. It was wrong. It was predictably wrong. We knew it was wrong then, but uh, there were some people who were gaining at the expense of others. Now, I wanna come back to the issue of authoritarianism because it's very much on the uh, agenda as we're discussing uh, the response to the pandemic. And some people look at uh, China and say, look how successful they've been in controlling the pandemic. It began there, but uh, they have gotten it under control. And uh, their surveillance economy seems to have worked. And that gives a boost towards authoritarianism. But I like to uh, respond by pointing out New Zealand, South Korea, Taiwan, a number of democratic governments have responded even more effectively in democratic ways. They're based on respect for science, respect of citizens for the government, uh, respect of citizens for each other, social cohesion and solidarity, all the social democratic principles. New Zealand has shown that they work, they can work, and has provided a democratic model for responding to the pandemic. And I think uh, that is really in the spirit of what Keynes was trying to do in the 30s. Of course, we need uh, to update it. It's, it's 75 years later, 80 years later. And as we think about uh, the response uh, uh, to the economic downturn and the pandemic, uh, it's trying to craft that, that combines uh, 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 the protection of democracies and human rights with uh, economic reinvigoration. Now, the interesting thing at this moment, at least in the United States, but I think in some other countries, neoliberalism does not have many defenders. The party of neoliberalism was the Republican Party. With the Republican Party becoming the party of Trump, it's not about neoliberalism. It, you know, it's bluster in terms of government doing this or that, intervening and you know, deciding that we ought to expand one sector and contract another. It's government intervention 
Now, it's not intelligent intervention, but it's activism. And the interesting is some of the other Republicans who are not quite so much bluster, like Rubio, have really ad adopted a very active industrial policy. They've gone into market activism. And so uh, it, it is interesting that the uh, political landscape in the United States uh, has changed dramatically in terms of the basic views about the relationship between the government, the state, and the market with there being no vocal de uh, defenders of laissez-faire neoliberalism. The only question is uh, what kind of intervention is appropriate and how do we maintain a rule of law in a world where government is intervening? But there's a, could I just make a point there? I mean, I think that's an important point. There, how do you intervene and what are the consequences of intervening? I mean, one thing I don't think globalists um, have ever really grasp is that effective intervention um, in, in, and particularly the control of financial forces in the world will involve limitation on capital movements and also some um, degree of protectionism, probably. Liberals are very, very, um, uh, very, very embarrassed by these two uh, types of intervention. The authoritarians don't mind them at all. Whether they do them or not is a different matter, but in principle, they're not against them. But liberals find this very, very difficult. And going back to the interwar years and Keynes, I mean, he came out in favor of protection in 1933. He said, this is the only way of getting something done. Now, if we had a perfect world system, if there was a sort of you know, clearing union, an international financial system, which didn't penalize debtors, we could do without many of these controls. In fact, that would be the, the, the first best. But as we don't have these things, we have to then maybe fall back on the, on the second best. And the question then is how realistic it, it, is it to get a first best? Do liberals spend all their time saying we must have new world institutions and, and the European Union must become a political union um, and, um, uh, you know, and, and, and that's what we should aim for? Or do they say, look, we live in this world, what are we going to do to safeguard our people in the next five years? Now, I think that is a dilemma, and I think people answer it in a different way. I mean, Danny Roderick has one sort of line on it, and I know you've argued uh, on this, on this. but to me, that's a problem. Are you a nationalist or are you an internationalist in the situation in which you find ourselves? I think, I, I want to ask Joe to answer that because it's something that Joe and I have discussed a lot. And at the beginning, Joe said, well, Europe's got to push for global governance. And actually, I am very skeptical about whether national policies, maybe in America, because it's so big, can actually solve the problems of the people who voted for Trump. I mean, I, I just think you can't bring back uh, traditional manufacturing. And what's more, protectionism tends to... Um, restrict the imports that you need for your manufacturing because we're all so interconnected. But I'm not going to go on on what I think, but I do think want to hear from Joe because that was actually going to be my next question. Doesn't Keynesianism actually have to be more global? Keynes, traditional Keynesianism was very much linked to the behavior of the state. Yeah, well, I mean, first, I, I, it's very clear that Trump uh, has... Uh, is driving with his eye totally on the rear view mirror. He's trying to create a world of the 1950s uh, and you know, with manufacturing uh, jobs, uh, with the social relations. You know, the 1950s is viewed as the great era of America, but it wasn't so great for women. It wasn't so great for minorities. Uh, it, it, it had a lot of flaws in it. Uh, and we don't want to go back to the 50s. 
But the fact is, in terms of the structure of production, you can't. Uh, the quest to rebuild manufacturing economy, we can get man some manufacturer manufacturing reshoring, but it, the production will be with robots. They won't be creating the jobs. The 21st century is a knowledge-based economy. It's uh, a service sector economy. It's an economy for the next 30 years focusing on a green transition. Investments for the green transition are going to create a lot of jobs. So it's, you know, I'm actually very optimistic about the ability to maintain a full employment for the next 30 years if we focus on the green transition, the service sector economy, the knowledge economy, and all these, and that will be accompanied by increases in standards of living. But if you uh, put your barriers between you and the rest of the world uh, with protectionism, standards of living are going to go down and you won't be creating uh, uh, the good jobs. Uh, we're not, you know, and, and there's been a lot of, of um, disingenuous uh, um, special interest uh, hype. So for instance, the coal industry talks about coal jobs. The coal production today is in open strip mines that doesn't use people. Uh, you know, the, the total number of coal miners in the United States, something like 50,000. There are three to five times as many people in solar panel installation. You know, this is a dead industry. Uh, yeah. So the, the issue is uh, we, we, we have to be, you know, looking forward in uh, restructuring uh, our economy. Yeah, we, we, sorry, just one comment, if I may. The way we often see it in, in Europe, and especially in the UK, is that what automation, um, insofar as it's happened, has led to is an increasing decanting of the less skilled as well as um, middle managed, uh, middle professionals into lower, lower paid, lower skilled job. You've got a big, big expansion in the lower, um, um, branches of the retail sector, retail accommodation, uh, hospitality, all the bits that have been actually hit by COVID as well. And, and so we don't quite see where, I mean, what you, how, how, how are those people who are on minimum wages, zero contracts, really struggling, often their wages being subsidized, how are they going to be shifted towards the green economy um, and, and at higher standards of living. I mean, that's, that's a so, transition so, we don't completely see. Well, let me talk about that in, in, in a couple ways. And then I wanna go back to the globalization issue very briefly. Um, part of the answer to this is that one of the reasons that workers are not doing very well is that we've weakened on both sides of the Atlantic workers' bargaining power, and we've enhanced corporate market power. Yep. In other words, the rules of the game have been stacked in ways that lead to greater inequality than they would. This is not just the abstract working out of the laws of demand and supply. The rules of the game are tilt the thing towards more inequality. Uh, secondly, we can take more active roles in steering technological change. It just doesn't come out of thin air. Uh, when we decided that we wanted to uh, think more about saving the planet, investments and in research were done and the price of solar and renewable energy plummeted. If we had done that 20 years ago, maybe that would have happened 20 years ago. We've been investing too much in research to replace labor rather than to augment and make labor more productive. So I think I, I view the, the, the task is, is 
not just to passively say technology is doing this, it's to take a more active role in steering uh, technology. Thirdly, we, we have to uh, engage in more redistributive taxation and expenditure policies. You know, the fact is that there is a huge increase in inequality and much of that is associated with uh, exploitation. Taxing exploitation market power actually leads to a more efficient economy and uh, a more equal economy. And then finally, let me just uh, come to the issue on globalization and the question you asked about uh, first and second best and, and, and should we be, um, you know, I take a more pragmatic uh, view uh, on uh, trying to uh, work on the evolution of institutions, do what we can within existing institutions and then push them along to change all this takes a lot of time, doesn't happen overnight. But for instance, uh, one of the ideas that Keynes talked about was uh, a, a creation of what is today called special drawing rights, uh, global money. And that was put into the structure of the IMF. And the IMF right now, right now, could issue $500 billion of SDRs. And that would make a big, uh, impact in stimulating the global economy. Uh, why hasn't it done it? The head of the IMF has called for it. Two countries have voted against it, India and the US. And this is where a change in administration could make a very big difference. The US alone has the power to veto it. A change in US Treasury would change that. And uh, uh, some European countries have shown a lot of magnanimity and they've said, we will donate or lend our SDRs to developing countries and emerging markets that need it. Um, so uh, it's even conceivable if there were the right Congress in the United States, we don't have, it looks like we're not having it now, but we may have it uh, in two years time. Uh, there was a bill in US Congress for an expansion of SDRs by $2 trillion. And that would make a, a really big difference. So these are the kind of you know, gradual changes uh, that can make a difference for the global economy. Uh, Gordon Brown helped engineer uh, a global stimulus after the 2008-09 crisis. Uh, there was a kind of leadership that came from the UK at that moment of time. So uh, I guess what I say is um, uh, we can't do it alone. No country can do it alone. Europe and the United States are big enough. They, they can do a lot on their own. But we ought to be working with the global institutions that we have to see what we can do together. And then keep pushing for the reforms in them to make them better able to deal with our problems. Look, I think we should, that, this has been absolutely fascinating, but we should go to the last part of our discussion. And uh, because, as I said, this is Charleston Literary Festival, and um, it's all about the Bloomsbury legacy and culture. And so the last part is really to think about what's the link between culture and the economy. And I'm going to start by asking Robert what Keynes said about all this. Well, the first thing is he thought of um, economics as a means, not as an end. And he looked forward to the day when one day um, economists could be as useful as dentists. Uh, and, and he looked forward very to the approach of that time very quickly. He said, economics will get us over the hump. It's been the main occupation of uh, man, uh, humankind since the beginning, how to earn your living. Uh, we have lived in a world of scarcity. But technology is slowly bringing us abundance, not just technology, but technology um, 
fueled by capitalism, fueled by the love of money, as he called it. So the love of money drives everything. It's evil. It's, it's something that uh, the future will regard as a psychological disorder. Um, uh, and, but nevertheless, that's what drives technology. Technology drives us to abundance. And so in a hundred years, he wrote, this was in 1930, we would only have to work three hours a, a day. Um, and uh, to satisfy the old Adam uh, in us, as he put it, and, and you know, our time would be freed up for um, the higher things, art, culture, all the things his Bloomsbury friend really stood for. And as Virginia Woolf wrote, a room of one own, a room of one's own requires 500 pounds a year. So if, if technology can bring everyone 500 pounds a year, then they could all do uh, not quite what Virginia Woolf did, but uh, in, in, that, uh, in that vein. So that was really his, um, his utopianism. I, one should say it was a vision not un dissimilar to Marx's. Um, also the liberation of, of hu human, humanity from alienating labor, as Marx put it, would also um, uh, be be the dawn of a, of a new of a new age, and you see, I think all these great European thinkers who thought along these terms, they were very much heirs to the Judeo-Christian tradition. They start in paradise. There's then the fall, then your the divine injunction to labor by the sweat of your brow, the gradual removal of the sweat through robotics and a final return to paradise. I mean, I think that was, that was the, the, the broad context in which much of this argument um, was, was given. But maybe it's really relevant today because we probably do produce enough to give everybody 500 pounds a day and surely culture is so much less material if we're interested in saving on resources if we spent less t less money on buying clothes or food or washing machines and more on enjoying the theater or painting. But is and it- That might is also it, uh, contribute to the planet. But psychologically, what do you, do you believe? That you see the, the economists always took as, an, as, as a datum insatiability, and therefore you always have a scarcity problem. You never, you never get over the scarcity problem if you take insatiability as 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 a psychological datum. Um, yeah, because there's a always... difference. There's a difference yeah. that that uh, standard economics said that as we got wealthier, and we've gotten a lot wealthier in in in, in the last uh, ninety years, you would want to consume more leisure as well as uh, yeah, more I goods. Know. I know. And but... what is remarkable is the uh, magnitude of the uh, avarice or, or materialism. Uh, one of the things I wrote a paper uh, a number of years ago where I pointed out that uh, beginning around 1970, a very major uh, difference opened up between Europe and the United States. That up until then, the evidence was that the attitudes between material goods and leisure in the United States and Europe were very similar. But beginning around the last 40, 50 years, Europe decided it wanted to enjoy leisure more. You see it uh, canonized in, in France where the, the summer vacation is a, a, a holy writ that you, you couldn't uh, uh, violate. In the United States, it's gone the other way. Uh, people have one, two weeks vacation and uh, it, it's, it, the, the house of leisure in many cases uh, in aggregate has gone down. So um, it, it seems to me that, that this is part of maybe the aberration of uh, the United States, partly related to the growing inequality where the um, keeping up with the Jones has become uh, part of, you might say, uh, the culture 
uh, with so much inequality, everybody's material ambitions are set by the people who are much wealthier than they, and that that gets uh, 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 that kind of race uh, of, of material race. I wanted to uh, though close on one more remark, which is it, it's. Um, you know, the reason I think culture is so important uh, is uh, the old aphorism, as long as we're talking about the Bible, man doesn't live by bread alone. And uh, that the, the view is that, that ideas matter. Uh, you know, we, we get pleasure out of, uh, out of reading, out of books, out of ideas, out of debates like this one. Uh, and... Um, that uh, uh, constructing a society that shows respect for ideas is very important. And that's part of a culture war that is going on, I think, in the United States. And uh, that you know, brings us back to our original discussion of where is uh, the United States going? Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, I think this is all about, almost less about authoritarian and racism, but it's about whether we believe in truth, culture, reason, and whether those are the ideas that matter. Um, yeah. But, yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Joe. Oh, I was going to say, you know, many of these can be thought of, you know, not only related to culture broadly, but the entitlement value, the, the, the enlightenment values, Enlightenment in terms of uh, the importance of truth, uh, science, learning about uh, 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 nature, uh, social organization, which is based on rule of law, law and and demo uh, democracies based on separation of powers and checks and balances. Uh, one of my friends uh, said that you know today one has to relitigate the Enlightenment every day. Uh, that uh, what he thought was, you know, sort of deeply ingrained after 250 years of leading to an enormous increase in our standard of living, that people in the United States would be questioning the value of knowledge, the value of science, the value of our educational institutions uh, that Trump actually taxed, not subsidized, taxed our leading universities is really a, a, a statement about uh, the direction, you know, a statement of values, I would say, and the agree, direction of our society. I agree. Okay. Now, there's always been a division. Sorry, maybe we're about to. We should end in a moment. Yeah. There's been a division between art and art and science ever since the Enlightenment. I mean, literature has, on the whole, not been has been against science and technology, and and that's been there. I mean, and therefore the the vision of a scientifically governed universe has also always uh, mm -hmm. been quite horrible to many people who, who, are, who are in the arts. And I think Keynes was divided by, uh, by, about this, and that's why he wanted science and technology to have its day and then leave the scene, you see. Um, so uh, uh, that was his utopia. That's how he, that was his homage to Bloomsbury. Meanwhile, wow. he's... But I was thinking, in science, I was thinking that in, the real issue was insatiability and materialism, which is very much linked to unfettered capitalism. And I don't see, would you argue that was also true of science and technology? Well, yeah, you see, well, which, which drives which? Uh, there, wouldn't have been, there wouldn't have been technology without capitalism. I mean, I know that's a very, very sweeping statement, but it was, it was, it's acceleration from the point it had reached in the 17th century, let's say, um, was really due to the, to the um, triumph of the profit motive and competition, competition. So that drove the whole process. Um, and um, 
I think that's, that's how Marx set it up. That's why he wouldn't have regarded science and technology as an autonomous value. So um, let, let me think about it. I, I'd argued somewhat differently that I know that, you probably don't agree with that, but <laughs> well, I think that a lot of science, you know, so understanding the stars, uh, uh, astrophysics, is not about commercial. It's about uh, understanding the world we live in. Absolutely. And uh, uh, an awful lot of our. Uh, you know, the, the uh, trying to understand uh, DNA, that kind of research, it had enormous uh, commercial consequences, but those who were striving for it were just trying to understand the fun foundations of what was life. So uh, to me, uh, the I don't see that strong division. I, 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 I view... Yeah culture uh, as part of the way we understand ourselves and uh, they're complementary. But let me say one of the things where I probably, you and I probably do agree, which is that the capitalist system has worked very hard to shape us in ways that make us more materialistic. And that uh, so that this insatiability, this uh, is not an inevitable consequence. Uh, here, I, you know, I, I, I agree. We could have wound up very differently, and we still can create a, a society where people are more co cooperative than uh, competitive. That was one of the themes in my book, People, Power, and Profits. Uh, we can create different kinds of people with different kinds of economic and social systems. And uh, uh, that, you know, it's not easy. It's, it's, it's not an equilibrium theory. It's a, an evolutionary theory. But that, that is what I think those who are concerned with the direction which our society has been going uh, with this uh, insatiable materialism, uh, that's, I think, you might say the deeper reform uh, that we need to be thinking about. Well, thank you so much, both to Joe and to Robert. And actually, this is a conversation we could keep going, but I think it's really important to end on this notion that what's important are ideas and what's important is trying to understand the world. Whether you're trying to understand the world through the prism of art and literature, <laughs> or through the prism of what we call science. I just think that's, a, that's part of what it is to be human. Uh, and it may not at all be consistent with capitalism, but that's what this struggle with authoritarianism, with Trump, with Modi, with all these terrible characters is all about. So thanks very much and um, we'll talk more. Thank you, Mary. For Thank you, Mary. <laughs>